Hello, my beautiful kinky people. This is Madame Posh with the MP Experience, and I'm back with another Uncovering Kink video for you. In this week's video, we're going to be talking about Japanese rope, shibari, kumbaku, appropriation, and how we need to change some of our language and why. This is your first time watching a video on my channel. My name is Madame Posh. I am an educator, femdom, and kink event producer, as well as lifestyle coach out of Dallas, Texas. On this channel, we talk about kink lifestyle topics, as well as pro-black topics and feminist topics. And I do commentary videos, as well as vlog videos on my life. If you'd like to get more content from me, you can follow me on all the social medias at The MP Experience or at Madame Posh, and you can check out my website at The MP Experience or at Patreon at The MP Experience to support me and get more content that I can't put on YouTube or Instagram. All right, now let's get into the video. This video was inspired by a friend and fellow educator within the King community by the name of Sage. She is callme.sage on Instagram, and you can go watch her entire hour live stream on culture appropriation, specifically on Japanese rope bondage. I say this because it's really important that we recognize power in this situation. It's not just about, right, taking from someone else's culture. It's not just about that. It is absolutely about that, but that's not it. It is also about then having the power, right, to make that thing accepted or not accepted in spaces. So you get to play Russian roulette, pick the thing that you want with identities and cultures and things that you like without realizing that you are able to do that because you are in a position of power, because you get to decide as a white person what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, and other white people will listen to you. And so this is why I think it's so important that we talk about our individual roles in these conversations and in this fight. Because even if you don't think you're making a difference, even if you're not doing something on a systemic scale, even if you're not doing something that involves tons of other people and other groups and organizations, you have a responsibility to the rest of the community to know your role and where power and privilege shows up for you and how to dismantle that for yourself and for those around you as much as possible. Because we are all prisoners to these systems, all of us. But she has a good foundation of understanding exactly what a culture appropriation is and really spelling it out so even our fellow white allies can understand that whether they've done it consciously or not, we have all appropriated some sort of culture. So although you can totally get something from this video without watching her live, I highly, 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 highly suggest that you go watch that hour of life. Put it on in the background, you can just listen to it, She's also a very beautiful human, and so it won't hurt you to watch her gorgeous face educate you on some stuff, okay? They also go by she, they, and he pronouns. Just so you're aware if you happen to reach out to them, and they did give me consent to share some of their audio in this video and to talk about this topic in a way in which I was inspired to from her video. One thing I was really uh, relieved about as I was watching her video is that a lot of the things that she was mentioning, I had already been kind of questioning within our community of why we call things certain things and uh, why all these cis head white men are critiquing me about Japanese culture, but I didn't feel like I had any space to vent that since I was being critiqued so heavily by all of these cis head white male riggers. So uh, it was very validating for myself that like, hey, these things that I was already kind of concerned about and thought was appropriation and did not want to do and did out of the ignorance of being taught by these cishead white men. I'm glad to know that those concerns were valid and uh, where I still have some improvements to make as far as changing my language and, uh, and how I promote certain things. I was not as far off the mark as a lot of, I'm sorry, but the rest of people in the community. 
So please go check out any of the YouTube channels that I normally suggest about videos about appropriation. There's tons of videos out about appropriation right now if you don't know what it is. Basically when you take an oppressed people's culture and you are able to benefit or profit off of it. And it really, again, comes down to ownership and how you are profiting off of it. A great example that most people are aware of is uh, the Kardashian-Jenner family. Uh, most of their businesses are appropriated from black culture, but they also have stolen from Japanese culture. There was a controversy um, a few years ago, I think, or not too long ago, uh, where Kim Kardashian was trying to trademark kimono for a kimono line she was creating, and Japan was like, uh, absolutely a fucking not. <laughs> I wish that uh, I think some of I think that's one aspect of being a Black American that because we have most of our culture has been washed away we don't have the kind of agency to come together and like make that stand against people appropriating our culture and so uh, I feel that it's important that I don't uh, continue the oppressor's habits by appropriating other people's cultures. I've said on this channel before that there I definitely believe there's a difference between appropriation and appreciation as well as what I call and what I've heard other people call a fusion. So think of this as like you know a taco with uh, with with another culture's uh, type of seasoning or flavoring or toppings in it. Tex-Mex is like a horrible example because I fucking hate Tex-Mex and it's the only thing you can get in Texas like you really have to go to like the inside knowing spots to get like real Mexican food which is much better. I've always loved cultures and loved learning about new cultures and loved uh, trying to figure out how to incorporate some of those cultures into my art uh, in an appreciative way. But I've always done it in a way of wanting to be educated and never really, never really promoting or taking ownership of something to make money off of it w without understanding the history behind it. So I definitely think that you can appreciate someone else's culture and participate in someone else's culture without appropriating it. But that does require time and education and really understanding and sometimes even the blessing or or the permission of, of elders or people who are ex respected in that culture or that social group. So again, I highly recommend that you go watch uh, Sage's live stream. The way that they talk about it uh, is much more polite and politically correct, even though I know that she seems, she feels like sometimes she's being too aggressive. They just come off so like sweet to me. And I just, I look at them as someone that I aim to be able to give information in that tone. But for this video, I'm going to give it to you straight, okay? I'm going to give it to you straight. So let's start out with one of the questions that she asked on her live stream, which is if you are into shibari, kimbaku, rope bondage, you tie in some way, and you've been going to education on a consistent basis, how many culture or Japanese history or shibari history classes have you been to? She on her video asked this and then they paused and let the chat respond. I'm just pausing because I know that the answer is very few. <laughs> because even her being a biracial human from Japanese uh, descent said that she had only been to maybe one or two. I again felt really blessed when I was watching this because I have actually been to five and I have been able to get a foundational history of, of, of Japanese shibari and kimbaku from someone from Japan. And I had to have it translated because she only spoke Japanese. So it was very much a, a very honored blessing that I had that opportunity. And as they were talking about this on their live stream, I definitely was like, oh, I didn't realize how much a blessing it was. And also still need more than five. I will admit, I really love learning about history and culture. So I have been I sought those out. I, you know, there were maybe other classes during a, a convention period or a time that I could have gone to, but I really sought those out and made sure I was in those classes and have been very hungry to learn more about the actual history and culture of, uh, behind Shibari and Kibaku and just have not had enough resources, to be honest. I have 
probably about eight or nine pages of notes. I know I did a live stream with one of uh, the fellow riggers in our community about some of the traditional Japanese rope bondage, but he is also a cis white man. I, I, I have only had the opportunity of learning about it from a Japanese person in, in one intensive weekend. And that transitions perfectly into the next question, which is, who are you learning shibari or kimbaku from? Because probably, at least until recently, 60, 70, 80% of the time, it's from a white cis head male. Unfortunately, they historically uh, have appropriated many cultures. So I just want us to ask ourselves, how can we say that we're doing shibari or kimbaku when those are very traditional Japanese arts? I have made a habit even before I watched this live stream of saying that I do rope bondage because I was so heavily critiqued by cis head white men in the rope community about using terms like kimbaku and shibari when a lot of the styles or the, not styles, a lot of the techniques that I use in my rope bondage were Western style. But the way that they were communicating that was a way to be derogatory, to say they do kimbaku or shibari, but what I do is Western style rope bondage. And it wasn't meant in a way to actually be appreciative to Japanese culture. I also need folks to recognize that using Japanese language is also gatekeeping because we are basically saying that if you do not know Japanese or know these Japanese terms, you don't belong here and like good luck catching up to what we're talking about. And I'm not going to stop to slow down and I'm not going to explain things to you and I'm not going to say things in a way that is helpful for you and your accessibility needs. But what we're saying is if you do not do rope in this very specific way with this very specific language, you are not welcome or you do not belong. And that's unacceptable because guess what? Japanese isn't your language to gatekeep with, period, end of story. Because you already gatekeeped me with English. You already told me that if I didn't speak English, I couldn't be welcome. And now you're telling me if I don't speak Japanese, I'm not welcome. And it's like, okay, this is, this is so problematic. You don't get to gatekeep with a language that is not yours, period. Now, I've also met, met some cishead white men who have spent the money, key thing, money, and had the time and resources to go to Japan and actually learn from a Japanese rope master and have been given a Japanese name and told to basically come back to America and start a dojo. That is, again, a different situation. It's a little bit different situation when someone has like bestowed upon you the honor of that. But at the core of it, it still is an opportunity you got because you had the money and the time to go to Japan for two or three months to learn from this person. And most oftentimes, even filtering down from like who they taught to who is teaching you, we are still learning from their perspectives and their knowledge and not learning directly, again, from the masters or from Japanese people. And that's totally okay. But then we can't call it Shibari or Kimbaku. And so if we are marketing all rope classes as Shibari, then what the fuck is actual Shibari? If everything that we do is shibari, then, then what is actual shibari? Because if all of these styles and all of these types of rope can fall into our American definition, wouldn't you agree that we would be doing something different than shibari then? Because it is in the context of the American landscape that we are engaging in? Something similar, absolutely, but different here in America because it is different because I have seen Western style rope being labeled as shibari. Those aren't the same thing. And we need to stop using shibari as a catch-all term for rope because guess what? We can say rope. I had people in my local community who very much touted a lot of names that they learned rope bondage from and always would say how much how many times they'd gone in Japan and you know learn from you know Japanese people and then as I found out more information the first person to teach them a lot of stuff was another cishead white man but they didn't mention his name because that didn't give them the clout I didn't give them the esteem or the or make them look better right and so 